I just love seafood, but my little sister Amanda, not so much. So today, I'm determined to get my sister to eat and enjoy fish. And I've got a sneaky plan. I'm going to hide it in a taco. But I also want to be responsible about the fish I buy, and that means going to the experts to learn about our fisheries and how to keep them strong and healthy. Will my tacos be enough for my fish-phobic sister? I certainly hope so. It's hard to believe my sister and I grew up in the same house. I love seafood and her, well, she's not so sure. It got me thinking, where does our seafood really come from? And my mission is to finally prepare a seafood dish that she will actually eat. First stop, the Santa Monica Pier Aquarium. They know a thing or two about the health of our oceans and the seafood within them. This is the Santa Monica Pier Aquarium. It is Hilda Bay's educational facility where we teach marine science education and conservation to schools. I touch it! There are hundreds of species of animals that live right outside these doors and they are critical to the environment that we live in because we use the ocean as food. Um, it keeps us healthy and alive and it's just a beautiful place to uh, be a part of. I've heard of food chains before, but Jose stressed it's more complex than that. It's actually a food web let's say a uh, rocky reef. In that community, there are hundreds and hundreds of species of uh, organisms, algae, sometimes plants, uh, fish and invertebrates, and all of those animals have very special relationships with each other. A lot of times, based on who's eating whom. In a food chain, you usually have smaller animals being eaten by bigger animals, and eventually top predators eating those animals. But that's just one part of a very complex web that's uh, found in a sp specific environment. Sometimes those relationships are not linear, they're very complex and web-shaped, kind of like a spider's web. There are so many things going on, so many creatures that are uh, producing and preying and, and also acting as, as important predators to that environment. In a healthy food web, you see very robust and very diverse species of organisms. Everything from different types of algae, to different inverts, and then of course fish uh, and larger predators, including mammals and birds. Jose said all you need to do is remove one type of fish from that web and the entire thing is in danger. That's what's happening right here in the bay. Over the last few decades, we've taken, we've harvested, we've hunted many, many spiny lobsters and sheephead fish, which are really important predators. Sheephead fish and spiny lobsters are big predators of urchins. And when we remove those predators from that, from that food web or from that community, then those animals run them up and they destroy. They actually will completely wipe out that ecosystem by eating pretty much everything in sight. When they do that, all the other organisms that depend on that just collapse. It's really, really important that we manage and we protect uh, and we hunt sustainably. But how do you know what seafood is being harvested in a way that's healthy for both us and the ocean? One of the best things that consumers can do for a healthy ocean is to vote with their pocketbook, which basically means making healthy environmental choices when they are purchasing seafood. One example of what consumers can do to vote with their pocketbook is using the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Guide. I printed out this Seafood Watch card online, and basically what it does is it provides options for good choices and not so good choices in terms of seafood so that you can choose to support environmentally sustainable seafood. Among the best choices on the Seafood Watch Guide are the California Spiny Lobster, the Pacific Halibut, and U.S. farm-raised rainbow trout and tilapia. Generally, mussels are an environmentally healthy choice. They're low on the food chain, so they're eating algae and filter feeding, and they're often farmed, and the farming practices are pretty good. They're not contributing pollution to our ocean ecosystem. And halibut from Alaska are sustainable, are considered sustainable because they are heavily regulated in terms of their fishery. So there's a limited catch, so that way the fish can be sustained into the future and we can continue to eat it and feel good about it. Check the Seafood Watch Guide before purchasing. Once you've checked it out, you can find out what sounds good to you that evening and go ahead, head to your fish market and buy your best choice and have a tasty meal. Now that I know a thing or two about making good seafood choices, it's off to my local fish market. They're setting me up for a delicious taste test.
With sustainability in mind, I'm off to my local seafood market. I'm sure they'll have plenty of good choices for my fish tacos here. Hey Katie. Hi Claire. Thanks for having me today. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, a, welcome. Thank you. What are we looking at? Well right now this is a rainbow trout. We have over 100 different kinds of fish here at Santa Monica Seafood. Generally only about 50 or so per day in the case, but oh. you can always get things on special order. Oh my gosh, I mean, I've only had probably 10 types of fish here. This is a whole fish, so you can see it has everything on it, head, tail, fins. Mm -hmm. This one has been cleaned, so there are no insides there. This fish is beautiful, but I mean, how can you tell that this is a really fresh, ready to eat fish? There's a couple ways you can tell. Um, visually, mm -hmm. you want it to have kind of a shiny, glossy look. You don't want it to look dull. Also, you want to check the eyes. Clear eyes are better. You don't want them to have a cloudy effect on the eyes. This one doesn't really have gills because it's already been cleaned, but the gills will be very red. And what determines a fresh fish? Uh, like, When was this caught? How long did it take to transport here? Fish are generally caught, if they're going to be fresh, it's within a few days and shipped. Wow. So this fish is probably not very old. If it's going to be frozen, either on the boat or immediately after, then your transport time might be a little different. But we get mostly fresh here. Well, I can't get over just looking around the case, all the different cuts, all the different types, and you have multiple versions of the same fish from different yes. areas farm-raised, wild, kind of whatever you need, it's available. Let me just show you a couple different cuts that we have here. I just showed you with the rainbow trout. This is the exact same fish, but it's been butterfly cut. You can see it's missing its head and tail, and they've also removed the dorsal fin. So if you open it up, all the bones have been taken out. Wow. Now you just have the meat which you can use for stuffing, grilling, anything yeah. you want. For butterflying, it looks like you could do a lot of the same stuff you do with a whole fish. So you could roast that really easy, pan sear it, lots of applications for this. Definitely. The filet is, again, just the one side of the fish. Mm -hmm. This filet is a John Dory, mm -hmm. which you can tell by the skin. Yeah. You can have the skin on or off, depending on your preference, mm -hmm. but it's one side and it's generally boneless. Lastly, we have the steak cut. This is an Alaskan halibut steak. You can see the bone has been left in here, literally just the cross section of the fish. Wow. This is perfect for grilling because it's already very compact, it stays together, it's not going to fall apart. That's great. Some fish are better suited to different cuts and different cooking styles. That's so cool. And this is the kind of thing that you could definitely have your fishmonger do. Yes. So it's sort of like the busher of the sea. You just sea. have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm here today because my sister is not a fish eater at all, and I'm trying to get her to try my fish tacos. So is there, can you direct me in terms of like a mild, easy fish for her to try? I've picked a couple things for you to try so you can get an idea of what she might like. Well, I've never had a fish tasting, so I cannot wait to dig in. This is going to be good. I want you to start with the Alaskan halibut. Mm -hmm. uh, as the name implies, it is from Alaska, from the Alaskan waters. Up there, you know, it's a wild territory, so the fish tend to be bigger, more oil content because the water is colder, mm -hmm. but it also makes for an excellent fish. Yep. Now, this is absolutely delicious, and you can see it's so flaky mm -hmm. and moist and has a really rich flavor. Yes, that's the high oil content for sure. Secondly, you can try the California halibut, so you can compare the two halibuts. Wow. This one is from the Central Coast waters here in the state, and it, as you can see, it is a little bit thinner. Mm -hmm. Thinner filet, a little less oily, mm. but still an excellent flavor, moist, flaky. That is delicious. And so the California and the Alaskan halibut, it's the same fish, they just live in different waters. And they are a slightly different variety, but they both are halibut in the halibut family. And the third one I picked for you to try mm -hmm. is the whitefish. And this is actually a domestic fish as well. It's coming from Lake Superior. Oh. So slightly different than the other two, which is the ocean caught. This is a lake mm. fish. Also very sweet, moist. And this one, we generally keep the skin on. Mm. It adds more flavor. And again, it, it helps keep it together when you're cooking because it is a softer fish. This has such a delicate texture yes. compared to the other ones. And it's so interesting tasting these side by side because very similar flavor profiles, mm -hmm. like all that kind of mild, buttery, really tasty, but this one, yeah, it, it's, the flakes are a lot smaller, a lot finer. Yes. And it almost, this one, I like, it uh, melts in your mouth a little bit, whereas these two, they are a little more toothsome, but this, that flavor, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's gonna be a tough decision. All very good. I know, it's, it's a good, this is a good, a good hard decision to have. I think because of tacos, and we're gonna be having a lot of fun with really bright, mm -hmm. high acid flavors and a little bit of heat, I think I might wanna go with one of the halibuts. We 
have them both fresh right now because they are in season. Wild fish has very specific cycles that we can harvest from and that we can't. It's almost like when you're hunting or even if you're gardening, you have to wait until the fish is fully mature and ready to harvest. Yes, absolutely. It's exactly the same thing because we are trying to sustain the populations and so we only harvest fresh fish when it's available and able to do so. It's a huge effort that we make here to only harvest things that, that are done in a sustainable way and that have minimal impact on the environment. The fish is not going to get any fresher today, so when I take this home, what should I look out for? How should I keep it in my refrigerator? When should I cook it by? Well, it's very important, obviously, that you keep fish and other seafood very cold. Mm -hmm. So you want to get it home as soon as possible and into the refrigerator. A lot of people would like to keep it even on ice in the refrigerator, in a colander or something so it can drain freely. You generally want to prepare it within a day or two. Otherwise, you're, you sh it's actually recommended that you do freeze it yeah. because freezing will maintain the quality with the flavor as well. I'm going to go with the Alaskan halibut. It grills really well and I'm going to be doing grilled fish for my fish taco. I think you made a really good choice. I think with the Alaskan halibut, I'll be able to get Amanda to try a fish taco but I'm grilling up some corn just to be sure. So I have everything I need to make fish tacos for my sister Amanda and our friend Nick. And I'm really excited because I found a trick to get Amanda to eat her fish tacos. I'm gonna put a corn salsa on it because Amanda loves corn. And to make the salsa, I start with lime because the trick with lime is it works great with the corn to cut through the sweetness. And you just need a little bit, just half of a lime. And I'm just gonna juice it with a fork, really simple, right into my bowl. There you go, you just squeeze it, and use the fork to get all of that juice out. But if you do wanna do this ahead of time and measure it, it's about a tablespoon and a half. And next, I'm gonna add my red onion. And what I like about adding the red onion to the lime juice ahead of time is what it does is it gets all of the bite out of the red onion. The acid in the lime really works to sort of tease that out. So you end up with a very mellow flavor and it's not very overwhelming, which I really like. I wanna keep the salsa balanced. So I'm just gonna add a couple of tablespoons of this. All right, and next I'm gonna add some finely chopped jalapeno. And jalapeno is a spicy pepper and it's pretty spicy. So I don't like adding a ton. I like adding just a pinch, just so there's a little bit of heat. But if you love spice, feel free to add more. I would say though, add a little bit at a time and taste as you go so you don't overdo it and kill the salsa. The reason why I'm adding this ahead of time in the lime juice is the same reason why I added the red onion. It really gets all of that heat kind of pulled out of the pepper so that it fills all the lime juice, so it coats all the corn, the entire salsa, as we go. This ensures that you get mellow heat all the way through. On to the star ingredient, the grilled corn. I love the flavor of grilled corn. It's all of that wonderful sort of caramelized flavor right on top, all those burnt bits, that's all flavor. And that roasted quality is so good in a salsa like this. I like to hold this upright and you just kind of are gonna do it like a square, like around a square, and you try to get it uh, pretty deep in there so you get all the kernels off in one fell swoop. Now I have my corn ready to go. I'm gonna put the cobs to the side. And I'm just gonna scoop this right up and put it in the bowl. There we go. And now I'm gonna add a little bit of cilantro because I love cilantro in sauces. I cannot get enough of this stuff. But if you wanna give it a little bit of a different flavor, you can use basil, you can use tarragon, kind of any soft herb, feel free to add it in. Now I'm gonna add a hefty pinch of salt and quite a bit of pepper just to get it really well seasoned. And you wanna break up the big pieces of the corn with your fingertips like so, just cause no one really needs a big hunk of corn in their fish tacos. So I just wanna get all of that lime juice just marinating over everything. And this is one of those salsas that I like to leave in the fridge for a couple of hours cause then all the flavors mingle together and you get something really lovely and balanced. And it has more of a cohesive flavor. So time for a taste test just to make sure everything's seasoned properly. Hmm. So it's right there. So I'm all ready to grill my halibut and I like to keep this so simple because we just have a beautiful piece of fish here. It's so fresh, so delicious. 
I don't really want to mess with it too much. So I keep it simple with just some salt, a little bit of pepper, and then olive oil just to make sure it doesn't stick to the pan. And I'm using a grill pan because I love the way that the, the heat distribution of the grill pan works with the halibut. You end up getting these really tasty grill marks that are just so good. If I could be outside today, I would love to use an outdoor grill, but because we're inside today, the grill pan works totally fine. And while I have it cooking on here, I'm gonna season the other side. grilled fish. So with a halibut and a steak this large, it's about a half pound steak. I like to cook it for about five minutes on each side. It ensures that it's evenly cooked all the way through, but it's not going to be dried out. And with a beautiful fish like this, you do not want to overcook it. So keep a close eye on it. So we're ready to start assembling our tacos. I'm gonna be flaking the halibut just so you get some really nice meaty chunks, nothing too difficult to eat. And the way we do that is really simply just with a fork and you kind of pick at it like as if you were a kid pushing food around your plate. You can see all of those beautiful fishy flakes coming apart. So we've got our pile of halibut ready to go. And now the fun part, we get to build our tacos. So I have our beautiful warm tortillas right here. And the nice thing about warming them is it means they're really pliable so you don't get any cracks in the middle when you try to build your tacos. I'm just gonna take a small pile and just put it in the center. And now I'm gonna add a nice amount of the salsa. You don't wanna overwhelm any of the flavors. It's all about balance. And I know I love corn and my sister is obsessed with corn. So I'm gonna be a little bit more liberal with the amount of corn salsa. But you just want a good amount. You want a bite of everything as you eat your taco. For some crunch, I'm gonna add a little bit of shredded lettuce. Now I'm gonna add some crumbled cheese. And I like to use cotija cheese, which is a skim milk Mexican cheese that you can usually find in the refrigerated dairy section of your supermarket. And if you can't find cotija, anything like feta or just any cheese that sort of readily crumbles is totally fine. And now for the crowning glory, crema, which is just a Mexican version of thinned out sour cream. And the crema just adds this lovely richness and moistness that is so good. It's like adding mayo to a sandwich. Great, so this is ready to plate. All right, and I'm gonna get started on the other ones. My sister Amanda is coming over with her friend Nick. Hope my tacos will be a hit. Hey guys. Hey. So I have our tacos ready. They look really good. Re okay, really? Yeah, they do. I've been a little stressed about this whole <laughs> day. <laughs> you don't like cooked fish. So I did, oh my gosh, you wouldn't even believe how much I went into these tacos. It's Alaskan halibut. Uh -huh. I tasted three different types of fish to choose the most mild and the best flavor okay. that I thought you would dig. And then on top of it, I covered it with a spicy corn salsa. My favorite. I know you love some corn. <laughs> so I figured if I kind of, it's like hiding vegetables in like meat sauce for little kids. Yeah. I figured if I cover the halibut with uh -huh. a ton of corn salsa, you'll like it. So good. I'm excited to try it. Oh, good. Yay, I'm so glad. And Nick, you spent some time in Alaska. Scott, right? That's right, yeah. I was up there for a couple years studying salmon, but well, halibut's one of my absolute favorites. And up there, they have the best, like, fish and chips made with the halibut. Oh, wow. And what's really nice about it is it's part of just like a whole ecosystem, which is what I was doing there. And just most people look at the ocean and they think of it as just endless blue. And they don't think about like what's underneath. And it's not just the fish that you've got here on our plate today, but it's the crabs, the snails, the sea lions, the dolphins, and they're all connected. And you take one piece out and it all falls apart. You know, everyone's like lions, tigers, bears, sharks, they're at the top of the food chain. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not really the case anymore. Yeah. We are. Mm -hmm. And so if we go out in the ocean and say, take all the tuna mm -hmm. or all the halibut or all the whatever, mm -hmm. we are removing a really important piece of this web and then other things start falling apart. Yeah. I mean, if we think a little bit and we start, say, maybe just taking a little of this and a little of that and letting everything remain in that beautiful balance, mm -hmm. you know, we'll have this fresh seafood forever. And I want you to be cooking these things up for me every night, right? Yeah, I want my kids to be cooking these. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so you don't have to just say, I'm never eating fish because of no. the issues of sustainability. I would rather eat what's delicious and what's actually responsible as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, I'm ready to dig in. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do it. 
Let me know what you guys think. Mmm, so good. For real? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's really bright. Like, I, I love the taste of the corn. It mixes really well with the halibut. So you would actually eat this again? Mm-hmm. It's not mm. fishy at all, is mm -mm. it? No. No. I tried to choose a fish that was, it could stand up to all the flavors you would normally find in a taco. So heat, cilantro, the acid and lime. It just tastes like all the flavors mix really well together. When you get kind of nervous about eating cooked fish, mm -hmm. and you think of like, oh god, it's the smell, it's the texture, yeah. blah, blah, blah. This no, is... No, this is great. Fantastic. You changed my mind. Yay! <laughs> mm. Closed captioning and other promotional consideration is provided by